In our series, American Autocracy, it could happen here. This threat, this specific threat of history repeating itself, has been hauntingly explained by an American hero named Guy Stern. Guy Stern escaped Nazi Germany at the age of 15, only to return as a member of the legendary Ritchie Boys. Now, the Ritchie Boys were a secret American intelligence unit, many of whom, like Stern, were German-born Jews who used their knowledge of the German language and German culture to interrogate captured Nazi soldiers. The Ritchie Boys were responsible for most of the combat intelligence the United States got from the front lines. Stern was awarded the Bronze Star, but his entire family perished at the hands of the Nazis. Guy Stern passed away in December at the age of 101, but he never stopped warning us about forgetting these lessons, about the danger of forgetting the lessons we learn from history. This is what he told our friend, filmmaker Ken Burns. We have seen the nadir of human behavior and we have no guarantee that it won't recur. If we can make that clear and graphic and understandable, not as a, something to imitate, but as a warning of what can happen to human beings, then perhaps we have one shield against its recurrence. One shield. Joining us now, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker, documentarian. We've called you a legend already. We'll do it to your face. Kim Burns, we're so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be with you. Welcome back, Nicole. We miss Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this, this, this maybe is all that we should be doing, right? Maybe all we should be doing is using our space to remind people what history teaches us. In a, in a place where there's so much disinformation and misinformation, there's also bullying and making the other of somebody. We are desperately in need of the kind of clear-eyed uh, view of Guy Stern. He lived to be 101 because he had escaped. You know, he'd been the one selected from his family to go to the United States to try to get the others out. He couldn't get them out. He joined the army. He went. He lost everybody. And he has borne witness to that. Just back up a little bit. You were asking Andrew um, a really good question. Ten years ago, could you have thought of this? Let's say in 1932, you wanted to be in the most civilized, cosmopolitan place on the planet you know, where everything was new in literature, in architecture, in music, in cinema, in ideas. There would be no better place in 1932 than Berlin. Mm. The next January, not so much. And so we realized how precipitously we fall. I'm now, I'm now working on a film. I mean, this one and Guy's words continue to resonate with us, and we're talking about it daily, but we've been working on a film about the American Revolution, like where we came from, where we were born. And for me, it's a kind of reverse engineering that can take place. Mm -hmm. A few lines past the famous lines of the Declaration that we know and quote the second sentence. Jefferson said, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. What he's saying there to all of us is that heretofore, all human beings have been subjects. They've been under authoritarian rule. And we're suggesting that there could be a new version of this, that you could be actually a thing called a citizen instead of a subject, that you could be not a superstitious peasant filled with that misinformation, that disinformation, that bullying, but you could be something else. That's the promise of the United States. It didn't fulfill it at any point for everyone, but we were at the very beginning wrestling with the noblest aspirations of humankind, and they had nothing to do with authoritarianism. And now we find ourselves in this improbable, please wake me from this nightmare dream, that these things are possible here. It can happen here, and we do have the momentum of most of human existence to show that it could, that we have been 
an outlier, and then a kind of inspirer of others to resist this tide, and that we have held high in, in Washington's resigning his military commission, in him resigning from the president, not leaving after two terms, of this idea that the highest office in the land is a citizen. But there are people and tendencies, human nature doesn't change, history doesn't repeat itself, but human nature doesn't change. And so we are find people relentlessly drawn to these power moves, this bullying, this dissonance, the, the vulgarity that authoritarianism is. I mean, to take Guy Stern's story and, and the exquisite clip of him and his warning, I mean, it just, it brings tears to my eyes at the end of a broadcast that started with Jim Shooto's new reporting about John Kelly having to sit Trump down and say, you can never say Hitler did good things. Because we're not just talking about, right, you're talking about our, sort of our obligations as citizens. Um, we're not just talking about citizens, we're talking about someone who ended America's tradition of a peaceful transfer of power. How did we get right here? Yeah, I, I, I've asked myself this question through all of the studies. You know, there have been demagogues, dangerous ones in the history of the United States. Huey Long, for one, I made a film about him 40 years ago, you know. But he was a populist but who actually delivered to the poor. We have somebody who delivered a tax break to his wealthy friends and then stacked the Supreme Court with people who would vote his way on, an, on divisive issues that set everybody against themselves. So one of the biggest things in authoritarianism is you have to create an enemy of them. It's not us, the United mm. States, capital, lowercase us, and also we and our. It's always them, and they're doing something like that. So we've got this situation. So I think somewhere along the line, the Republican Party, when communism disappeared at the end of the 80s and the early 90s, lost its enemy. And when you didn't have something to make an enemy of, who did they turn to? Bill Clinton. And then later, by extension, all Democrats, distracted by terrorism, distracted by other things in which we could force our gaze outward. But when you've created a circumstance where you have got a large segment of the population believing that the opposite party are actually evil, in some cases, blood-sucking pedophiles, that, that people actually believe, that's the end of civil discourse. That's the end of bipartisanship. That's the end of compromise. And then the byproduct of that is that slippery slope that permits you to have more restrictive laws, more fundamentalist laws that see only things in sort of a manichae and black and white when we know how complex and diverse and vibrant and rich our society is. And then, as our founders feared from the very, very beginning, they tried to reverse engineer too. Well, what if somebody tries to do this? What if they do this? They were always worried about a demagogue who would come along and exploit this. And so when a demagogue comes along and exploits What's this? Every alarm must be going off. You're talking about weeping for your country. I want my country back. I want, why is it? You know, one of the first things that ends, it'd be so, you, you can judge somebody by the company they keep. It, keep. And the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, Orban and Putin and Xi and Kim Jong-un, you know, these are repressive, murderous individuals. And Orban takes over the press, eliminates dissenting parties, co-ops the courts. And so what of your discussions have been most of the day is about delays in courts, about peaceful transfer of power, about the independence of that judiciary. And so there's, this is all the playbook of authoritarians for as long as there have been authoritarians. And we ought to be standing and in every Middlesex village and town and screaming at the loudest that this is not us. Yeah, I want to put to you a question on the other side of a break that I put to Liz Cheney, that I put to people who, who study autocracies, um, about where we are in our slide and, and can we still can we still make a U-turn? Um, don't go anywhere, we have to put in a quick break. Ken Burns will be right back with us.